I review very briefly what I have said about, so far about the measure theoretical approach to the core. Following Aumann, we have a measure space of economic agents, and I intend to persuade you that it is not uh, generality in mathematical sophistication for the sake of mathematical sophistication. We have a set of agents, and we have a set of subsets forming a sigma field, in particular uh, closed under countable union. And the elements of script A we call coalitions. Nu is a non-negative measure. Therefore, for every coalition, E, we have a number, nu of E, non-negative. The measure of the total space is 1. Nu of E is equal to 1. And uh, the uh, measure nu is countably additive. That is to say, if you take the measure of a countable union of mutually disjoint sets, the measure of the union is equal to the sum of the measures of the different parts. And the interpretation of nu of E is the economic importance of the coalition E. We have to define for every agent A in A its uh, characteristics, and they are a preference relation, sub A, and an endowment vector, E sub A. What do we assume about these two objects? The preference relation for every agent is a complete preorder with a closed graph. Now, those concepts are very familiar to everybody who has attended these lectures. In addition, we assume monotony, that is to say, if two vectors in the commodity space are L, we have L commodities, satisfy the vector inequality coordinate wise which is to say that in every coordinate y is at least as large as x, and for at least one coordinate we have a strict inequality. This implies that y is preferred by agent A to x. Monotony in this sense. Uh, I emphasize the fact that there is no assumption of convexity on the preferences. That is one of the byproducts of the important byproducts of this approach. And when a preference relation satisfies all the conditions I have listed, they are, by definition, elements of the space of, the space of preference relations, script P. This space is endowed with the topology uh, of closed convergence, as I have defined it in the first lecture. As for, uh, so this is for every A, an element of script P. And as for the endowment vector, it is simply an element of the closed positive orthant of the commodity space. And so in technical language, an economy is a function, an economy script E, is a function from A to the Cartesian product P R. L plus. That is to say, with every element A in E, we have associated an element of script P, an element of RL plus. This uh, function is assumed to be, first of all, measurable, as it must be. And, and the measure is uh, here, obviously, a Lebesgue measure. And here we have a topological space. So the notion of a measurable set is self-evident. And finally, we assume that the function E, which is a function from A to RL plus, is integrable. So that we can uh, speak about the integral, the endowment of a given coalition. And I think I have only one more concept to define to be able to state Aumann's theory, you say that uh, that's almost too high. So um, a coalition is an atom if the following is true. First of all, the measure is strictly positive. 
not zero. And if you try to take any measurable uh, subset of E, F measurable, F contained in E, then necessarily the measure of F is equal to the measure of E, or the measure of F is zero. That is to say, E is an atom if when you take a subset F of E that is measurable, the measure of F is either the entire measure of E or the measure of S is zero. In other words, you cannot split uh, E into uh, smaller measurable subsets, hence the name of an atom. And we assume that the measure nu, that is the critical assumption, is atomless. And that means that in that very rich space of agents, no agent has a positive influence. That is what in the economics literature used to be called uh, the assumption of atomicity. And in measure theory, you use exactly the opposite uh, terminology. So nu is atomless. And uh, this uh, being said, we have Aumann theorem. If the economy is atomless, and the sum uh, over A of E d nu is strictly positive. Now you remember this is a vector in Rn plus, strictly positive, all the components positive. Then the two sets in which we are interested, W of E and C of E, the core of the economy and the set of Alresian equilibria coincide. I hope I have uh, fully defined a Valrasian allocation and a core allocation in this context. If I have not, you can easily uh, reconstruct it. You simply introduce almost everywhere instead of everywhere uh, in the proper place and everything works out. So this is the remarkable result with very few assumptions. You assume that the economy has no atom. There is no agent that has a strictly positive influence. And you assume that the total endowment is strictly positive. That is to say, in the aggregate, you have a strictly positive quantity of every commodity. Of course, if uh, there is a commodity uh, in uh, zero quantity for the whole economy, no matter which way you divide it, everybody is going to get zero, every coalition will get zero, you can, in fact, dispense with those commodities in your model. So this can be considered as a completely harmless assumption. And the other assumptions are, as I, as I repeat now, the preference relation is uh, a complete preorder with a closed graph. It satisfies the monotony condition I have said. And the endowment vector is in RL plus somewhere. Under those conditions, you have equality between those two sets. Weak assumptions, a remarkable result. And uh, you see how it embodies what Edgeworth tried to do in a much more restricted context. But it has taken a while to reach that result, of course. And uh, it states the equality of two economic concepts which are motivated uh, with very different considerations. The case of the core, you have a concept of blocking of an allocation by your coalition. In the case of W of E, you have allocations that can be obtained by means of a price system. You cannot obtain this equality at a lesser cost, mathematically, than this uh, measure theoretical context if you want equality here. If you want approximate equality only, I will talk about that later. Of course, you can uh, use less mathematical machinery. But if you want every agent to be absolutely negligible, clearly, you must have a set of agents A with a high cardinality. Even if you have an infinite countable set of agents, then if all of them are negligible, the totality will be negligible. 
So you need a measure space of H. And that measure space is very familiar to all of us since mathematically it is uh, neither more nor less than a probability space, exactly isomorphic, with mu of capital A of Romane equal to 1. Or so much for Aumann theorem. And uh, all this was known at the time of my last visit, but what I would say now was not. And in fact, I want to later uh, to present results which are available only in unpublished papers, of which I am leaving the Xerox copy here if you wish to read. Any question about uh, the measure theoretical approach? One can go beyond that and uh, do what uh, Werner Hildenbrand did in his book, Core and Equilibria of a Large Economy, and uh, obtain approximation theorems when one has a sequence of finite economies converging to an atomless economy of this type. It's a very difficult subject, and his book uh, is, is the best reference I can give you on this matter. Is there any question on this? next topic I want to discuss is uh, the rate of convergence. I will go back to the simple case of replica economies in order to have a simple mathematical treatment. There are generalizations. Now we are going to make differentiability assumptions and as usual to avoid technical difficulties we will restrict ourselves to the interior of RL plus. So we have, for in the commodity space, uh, the positive orthant as usual, uh, the consumption set for all consumers, but we are restricting ourselves to the interior. And uh, also, I will denote by L the strictly positive part of the real line, interior of R of R plus, the set of price vectors will be the set of P in RL that are strictly positive, whereas in the past, most of the time in those lectures, they have been non-negative, and the Euclidean norm is equal to 1. They are strictly positive, always for the same reason. So an economy in this context is defined finitely many agents by the preference relation, an endowment vector for each one of them, i runs over a finite set from 1 to n. And those preference relations now are convex monotone, and of class C2, in the sense I have defined earlier. That is to say, for a preference relation, you remember, you take the Cartesian product, uh, interior of RL plus, interior of RL plus, here you have the graph of the preference relation, that is to say the set of pairs x, y, such that y is at least as desired as x, and you want the boundary of this set to be a C2 manifold. This assumption is uh, quite essential for what we are going to do. And finally, we assume an assumption which is slightly stronger than the C2 assumption. If you take 
the indifference hypersurface uh, going through any point x, then the curvature at any point is different from zero. And that is simply in order to obtain from this uh, preference relation a demand function which is uh, differentiable. And we also assume that the closure of the indifferent set that I have drawn is contained in the interior of RL plus. That is to say the indifferent surface does not touch the boundary always for the same reason. So with assumptions uh, like this, curvature different from zero, which means strict convexity, there is a demand function for each agent, and I will use uh, a subscript, fi of p and w, where p is a price vector in S, and w is a real number in L. Well, that is the demand for that ice agent, and that is of class C1 continuously differentiable as a consequence of all the assumptions that we have made. Now, as usual, if we calculate the aggregate excess demand for any given price vector, we have to calculate the demand for the ice agent. The excess demand for that agent is this vector, and the aggregate excess demand is obtained by summation from 1 to m. That is a vector in RL that I have denoted in the past by f of e and p. Here I want to emphasize the dependence on p, so e will appear as a subscript. e is the least E1 to EM of the M endowment vectors. You say that, uh, of course, P is an equilibrium if Fe of P is equal to zero. And you say that you have a regular economy in agreement with the definition I have given in the past if the following is true. You do not need the L coordinates of F, E of P to be zero because of Valras law. It is sufficient that L minus one of them be equal to zero. Let us take, for instance, the first L minus one. So we have this. And we say uh, that we have an equilibrium if, as I told you before, we have this equality or this equality, which implies this one because of Valras law. And we say that the economy is regular if zero is a regular value of uh, this function. So that is uh, a repetition, essentially, of what I have said about uh, uh, differentiable economies, regular, critical, etc. Now we replicate the economy uh, following uh, Edgeworth. And let us call E sub n the n replica of the economy. We have proved that if one denotes by W the set of Valras equilibria, and we are of course using the uh, equal treatment property, so we are in a space of dimension L times M, we have shown that D of Cn and W, the Hausdorff distance, tends to zero. That is the picture that you remember. Here is W, here is Cn, and the cores are nested. And we have said that this Hausdorff distance between the two sets tends to zero. The rate of convergence results that I have in mind simply tell you at what speed this convergence occurs. And the result is as follows in the context that I have defined, 
when n tends to infinity, d delta of c n n w is of the order capital O of 1 over n. Consequently, the distance between the core and the set of Valras equilibria tends to zero at least as fast as 1 over n in this differentiable context. The result was generalized by uh, Birgit Grodel, and uh, there is a substantial amount of work going on at the present time where by using different concepts of distance between those two sets, one obtains uh, better rates of convergence. But at least it is comforting to know that uh, that speed is uh, at least equal to 1 over n. The reciprocal of the number of replicas as the number of replications n tends to infinity. Uh, any question? I am surveying uh, these areas uh, and telling you only the most essential things in each case. theorem of Lyapunov, which um, I will state, if you have a measure space, AAU, without atoms, purely a mathematical result, and if you associate with every A in Roman A a vector in um, Rn, I am sorry, with every <laughs> subset, we can associate a vector if you integrate with respect to the coalition E. It does not matter which way you do it in Rn, not Rn plus. So you have for every uh, subset, measurable subset, a vector in a finite dimensional space. And that is a vector measure, nu of E, in Rn, if nu is countably additive. If it is countably additive, if the space is finite dimensional, and if the measure is atomless, then the set of all the points that you obtain here is necessarily compact and convex. That is the Apunov theory. And it's an extremely important result which is used in uh, probability statistics. And it tells you, for instance, that if you were to add a number of sets in the sense of integration theory, a very large number of sets, even though those sets may be of arbitrary shape, the sum that you obtain is necessarily compact and convex. And I will give you a finite version of this uh, in a few minutes. But uh, this convexity that you obtain in the aggregate, and to which I have alluded several times in the past, is entirely based on this result of Lyapunov, for which a complicated proof was given by Lyapunov, another complicated proof by Halmos, and a simple proof by Lyndon Strauss, who based it on the theorem of klein milman So in any case, it's a deep mathematical result but an extremely important one for economists because it tells us by simply aggregating a collection of sets over a very rich set of agents, namely an atomless measure space of agents, automatically you get a convex set in the aggregate. And usually we can prove our theorems by assuming just convexity on the aggregate.
with this as an introduction, I want to talk about finite economies and uh, give for economies with finite limiting agents inequalities on the deviation from competitiveness of an allocation in the code. So, in other words, we have a finite economy, we consider an allocation in the core, and we want to know how far it is from being competitive. This has to be said very exactly. A number of workers, as usual, have contributed to this area. They are, I think, first of all, Calvin. tell you on what result known to most of you the theorem is based. We have as before L commodities and uh, I will for every agent have a preference relation. The assumptions I will make are stronger than what is needed, but I aim uh, for simplicity. So the preference relation, we have a finite collection of agents. That is the fundamental distinction with uh, the work of uh, Aumann or the work on uh, replica economies, where in the limit you have infinitely many agents. We have a preference relation for each agent. We assume that this preference relation is monotone in the sense that y is strictly greater than x, both of them in RL plus, implies that y is strictly preferred to x by the i's agent. The preference relation is a complete preorder. 
no convexity assumption on preferences. It's an essential point. And to simplify notation a little, for a vector in RL, I define the norm, that is standard mathematical notation, as the maximum of the absolute values of the coordinates, x and h varies from uh, 1 <coughs> to l, l commodities. Simply a matter of notation, very standard concept. An allocation, f is a function from the set of agents, let us call it a, it's a finite set, to RL plus, such that the sum of the F sub A for A in E, in A, is, will of course have an endowment vector, is equal to the sum for A in A of the E of A, or E sub I, uh, you can go from one notation to the other. E sub I, E of A are exactly the same thing. I have used those two notations in the past, and I do so now. We have a set of agents A, and I denote the number of agents by N, just to simplify the writing. I will use, in the definition of uh, non-competitiveness, I take the supremum of E, and will I use parentheses or not? I use parentheses. E A1, that is agent A1, plus E A L. I will explain all this in a moment. I take the norm in uh, this, and the restriction is that A1, AL are all in A, naturally. And this is the definition of the number capital M. So what have we done here? We have taken among the set of agents an, a collection L, L being the number of commodities of agents. And we have calculated their total endowment. We take the norm in the sense I have said earlier, and you take the supremum of those norms when you take in every possible way L agents in your set capital A. Well, nothing uh, very sophisticated there. It is just a matter of taking as many agents as there are commodities, calculating their total endowment with the norm, with the infinity norm, doing that in every possible way, choosing A1 to AL in A, in every way you can. Now, let us take an allocation F that is in the core of the economy. And we have said in the past, in various ways, that if an allocation is in the core, and if you have a large number of agents, then the allocation is approximately Valraisian. In the case of an atomless measure space of agents, it is exactly Valraisian. We take pi to be the set of price vectors in RL plus, such that uh, the sum of the coordinates, pH, h varies from 1 to l is equal to 1. So that is the usual uh, fundamental simplex of the pi space. Uh, pi is precisely that. So if that is the theorem, if the allocation f is in the core of the economy, then there is a price vector in pi such that 
and I will give two inequalities that will tell you that if the allocation in the core is possibly not Valresian, it is almost Valresian. I will have to explain the second, but let me write them first. So the first inequality is that the average, 1 over n, the summation for all the agents of, I take the absolute value of p dot f of a minus e of a. Here, like this. And this is smaller than or equal to 2m over n. And I am going to write a second inequality, which is more interesting. But let me stop for a second and interpret this. This, of course, tells you how far you are from satisfying your budget constraint. If the budget constraint were exactly satisfied, you would have p dot f of a equal p dot e of a. And this number would be equal to 0. Of course, you cannot expect that to be satisfied in this case. But at least if you take the difference between p dot f of a and p dot e of a, of course, the absolute value. And if you take the average of this difference over all the agents, it is bounded by 2 times m, this number capital M, which is given when you know the economy, divided by n. That depends on the number of agents. So this tells you that uh, the price vector will be such that on the average, the budget equality for every agent will be almost satisfied. And by almost, I mean that you can give this bound on the average of the absolute values of the deviations. So the second is more interesting. And uh, perhaps I should, before I write it, make a drawing. So let this be f of a. We are considering that allocation in the core. And we take the set of all the commodity vectors that are at least as desired as f of a by agent a. So it's a set which um, I realize I have drawn as a convex set, but uh, it is not assumed to be convex. Simply, yeah, it's out of laziness because it's easier to draw a curve like that rather than a curve like this. It's not assumed to be convex. So what you do now, given that set, you consider the price vector P, the existence of which is asserted by this theorem. And you take, I will draw it a little more slanted, and you take the infimum of P dot Z in that set, that is to say you take the tangent uh, hyperplane that is orthogonal to p. And if you were in the budget uh, equilibrium situation, of course, e of a would be in that hyperplane somewhere here, and f of a would be that point. But once again, you cannot guarantee that this would be the case, but this inequality will give an upper bound on the deviation from the situation I have described. So you see exactly what happens if you have a Valraisian allocation. You have an E of A which is somewhere in the budget hyperplane. And this point here is the point F of A itself. So the second uh, inequality by Anderson is that if you take, once again, the average and we take now the summation for A in A of the infimum, as in the first case I will interpret all this, infimum of P dot X minus EA, when uh, X belongs to the set that I have given, you are going to take this in absolute value. And uh, sorry, this will come later. And x should belong to the set I have said. That is to say, x is at least as desired as f of a by the agent a. And you take the infimum of this expression, which is exactly what I have done. I have minimized 
and I have taken the difference between what you obtain when you minimize and p dot ea. And this is bounded above by the same 2m over n. So there you are. Uh, it can be considered to be the achievement after many trials and errors of um, the Edgeworth program. From these inequalities, you can very easily derive strong theorems, such as those that are used by Hildenbrand. So is that reasonably clear? There are the two bounds, and they tell you that uh, if you let n tend to infinity by keeping that number m uh, bounded above, which is perfectly admissible since, remember, you are always taking the supremum over the same fixed number of agents, L agents, the same as the number of commodities. And your allocation in the core is approximately Valraisian in the sense that given F in the core, there is a price vector such that, in this precise sense, F is almost Valraisian. It is almost Valraisian in the sense that the average of the deviations from exact uh, budget equality is bounded above by 2m over n. And also, you almost have uh, preference satisfaction or utility maximization, if you want to speak the language of utility theory, which is defined in this way in the precise manner I have said. You are going to take, through f of a, the indifferent set and everything that is above. All that, of course, is in Rn plus. And given p, you minimize, and you obtain, therefore, the infimum of p dot x for every x, at least as desired as f of a. And you want to know how far this minimum will be from p dot ea. This tells you that the average over all agents is bounded above by 2m over n. I will not prove the result, which um, is not too difficult to prove. By the way, the reference is in the list of references I have distributed. But I want to say a few words about the mathematical theorem on which it is based. Yeah. It could. Well, the reason why it would not rise as fast is that you are always taking the supremum over a small number m of agents. So even though you constantly increase the number of agents, you take the supremum only over a small coalition, a coalition which will become relatively smaller and smaller. The L is fixed, and the number n tends to infinity. Well, you can make it tend to infinity. This is a finite. Those are two finite inequalities. So you can use them as you like. So what you're sort of thinking of is that you've got a big set of endowments that's kind of fixed, and you've got to share that over on an increasingly large group of people. You see, let us, you have here all your endowments, E of A1, I will denote it by E1, E2, and we keep adding uh, some of them. But if all of them remain fairly small, let us say within a cube like this, even though the number may become extremely large, 1 million, 10 million, 100 million, since you are going to take uh, the sum over a fixed set L, which may be uh, in the simplest Edgeworth economy 2, in any case, if it were 100, 1,000, it would not matter, it remains fixed. So it is sensible to talk about this uh, capital M remaining bounded above while the number of agents increases. It is, of course, what corresponds basically to the assumption that the measure space is atomless, something like that. If you added uh, endowments and agents in such a way that some of them became very large with respect to the totality, then surely you would not have an interesting result. In any case, this is true whatever small n l may be, 
then you can interpret and use them as you wish. The mathematical result on which uh, this Anderson's proof is based is uh, the theorem of shapley folkman a result which is of special interest to us, not only because it permits us to obtain uh, beautiful results, but it was a pure mathematical theorem which was motivated by economics. It appeared for the first time as an appendix in uh, a paper by Ross Starr on uh, general economic equilibrium. And that theorem is of interest to mathematicians. It is the finite counterpart of Lyapunov theorem. What does it say exactly? I will first say it uh, loosely and then be very precise. If you take sets S1, S2, S M. I will assume that they are compact. Uh, it would be sufficient to assume that they are bounded. So we have M compact sets in, let us say, in Rn. And otherwise, their shape is completely arbitrary. So we make their vector sum. We obtain a set, which I will draw here. I do not specify where the origin is, because I don't want to be bothered. So we have the sum of the SI when I varies from 1 to M. And as I have told you, as a consequence of Lyapunov theorem, if we add here, if we integrated over an atomless measure space, instead of taking a finite sum as we do here, that set would be convex and compact. In the situation that we are studying, finitely many of them, what we want to be able to say and what we are able to say is that as the number of uh, sets becomes large, this set becomes almost convex. And that is the counterpart of the Apunov theorem. I have to be more precise for this to make sense, and I will do it. Uh, since all those sets are compact, this set is compact. So the philosophy behind this is that if you take uh, the sum, the average of arbitrarily shaped compact sets, then the average tends to be convex, more and more convex, as the number of, element, of factors increases. We can give an exact sense to how close a convex uh, a set is to being convex. Here is a compact set. We take, let us call it uh, T, we take the convex hull CO of T, which in this case would be obtained by pulling a string around the set as tight as we can make it, like this. Well, here is the convex hull. And it is very natural to measure the deviation from convexity for the set T by the Hausdorff distance between the set T and its convex hull. And that is exactly the measure that we are going to use. The theorem of Shapley Folkman will tell us in precise terms how the uh, convex hull of the average uh, becomes very close to the average itself. And in order to do this, I use exactly as uh, Shapley and Folkman did the concept of the radius of a compact set, call it T. Here is a compact set T, and I will give the formal definition first and then interpret it. 
the radius of t is, and I have to write the minimum and the maximum in the proper order, minimum when x belongs to t, y belongs to t, of the distance x minus y. So you take uh, two points, x and y, in t. You take their distance. First of all, you take the maximum when x is fixed, and then the minimum of this maximum. So what, in fact, are you doing? Uh, if you want, let us say this is uh, equal to well, r of t, it means that you try to take a ball with center x and radius t, and to say that you take here the maximum from x to y means that you take from the point that is as distant as you can be from x in t. In this case, it might be a point here. But then you will choose x in such a way that this distance is as small as possible. So you will try to find the smallest ball with center x in t that will contain the set. Right? This is what you are doing. And the exact bound, in the case of chaplet folkman is that the Hausdorff distance, delta, of 1 over m, summation over i, from 1 to m of the si, and the convex hull of 1 over m, summation when i from 1 to m of si, this Hausdorff distance is smaller than or equal to. And the number is, I will define L in a moment, L, square root of the dimension of the space divided by M. What is L? L is an upper bound. It is the maximum of all the radii defined as I have defined them a moment ago. So we have here, uh, if the radii of the sets are bounded above, of course, it cannot be that one of the sets becomes very large compared with the others, then the upper bound for the deviation from convexity is L, square root of the dimension of the space, divided by m, the number of factors. So if you do keep uh, L bounded above, that is to say those sets cannot be too large, and uh, of course the dimension of the space remains fixed, then when m becomes large, the deviation from convexity becomes small. And we could say glibly, in the limit you obtain the Apunov theorem. And to prove this result, chapelet Folkman, you only need a very elementary mathematical tool. And I said that I would stop about midstream, so this is a chance to have questions, discussion, and we have effectively a recess of some five minutes. Then I will go to another topic. Are there any questions on this? So this result has been around for a long time, and it is at the basis of the proof by Anderson of the inequalities we have given. I don't think we'll ever let the dimension of the space increase. But it becomes too complex. We always operate with a space of fixed dimension. That was, in particular, why the equal treatment property in the case of replica economies was so important, because it permitted us to work within a space of given dimension. Still have a lot to say, and I have less than an hour left. Uh, I am moving to things that are more and more recent. What I am telling you 
about now was um, discovered by Mas Collet about a year ago. It's not yet published, but I leave behind a Xerox copy of his preprint. There was an objection raised by uh, game theorists uh, since the beginning of the core theory in economics of the following kind. You remember our definition of blocking. Let us take, uh, if you wish, a finite economy. Then we have, for each uh, agent in A, a preference relation, an endowment vector. We proposed an allocation X, which is a function from A to RL plus, such that the sum of the X sub A is equal to the sum of the A sub A for A in capital A. And a coalition E, which is simply a subset of A, no problem since A is finite, E blocks X if it can do the following, takes its resources, E sub A for A in E, and redistribute them to its members according to this scheme in such a way that for every A in E, Y A is strictly preferred by agent A to X sub A. And so every agent in the coalition prefers what he, they can obtain together to what is offered to them in the allocation X. And in that sense, they block the allocation. The uh, objection to which I alluded is that, uh, after all, uh, this objection could, could be countered by another objection, by another coalition that could do better. So there is this weakness in the definition of the core uh, to which game theorists objected. And Mascolet gave a result that overcomes that objection in the following manner. He uses the concept of a bargaining set, going back to Aumann and Marshler. However, his definition of a bargaining set is slightly different from theirs, simpler, which is an advantage, not fully equivalent. So the only thing I can try to do is to convey the um, meaning that uh, Mascolet gave to his bargaining set, and we can discuss its intuitive appeal. L commodities, as always, RL plus being the common consumption set for all the agents. The agents form a measure space, an atomless measure space of agents, the same context as Aumann. And uh, Mascolet himself considers the agents as being the points in the unit interval. It does not matter. There is an isomorphism theorem. To keep things simple, let us say that the set of agents is the unit interval 0, 1, and the atomless measure is the Lebesgue measure lambda on i. This is isomorphic to the general situation I have discussed, that is to say an atomless measure space of agents. And we denote by script P the set of preference relations. So a preference relation belongs to script P if it satisfies very precisely the following assumptions. It is a complete preorder with a closed graph, and the preferences are strictly monotone. I don't write all those things. Uh, uh, the important point is that there is no convexity, of course. And you know that as soon as you see an atomless measure space of agents. You know that there will be no convexity assumption. That was really um, a, a very important byproduct of the introduction of measure measure spaces of economic agents, the fact that one can dispense with convexity. Well, the economy E, as before, is a measurable function from A to RL plus, such that the uh, total endowment uh, E exists, that is to say E is integrable, just as before. And uh, did I 
I'll get any assumption, and the sum over A of E D nu must be smaller than plus infinity. I should draw my infinity a little better, which means that the, the vector that you obtain by integration is in all its coordinates finite. As ever, an allocation is a function from A to RL plus that is integrable and such that the sum of the x d nu over A is equal to the sum over A of the E d nu. <coughs> And with this, I begin giving several definitions which are necessary for the theorem to be stated. The first definition is the definition of an objection. And an objection is a pair, SY. So that is the definition of an objection. You will recognize it. You have seen it before but I want to prepare what comes next. And uh, S is a subset of I that is measurable, that is to say it's a coalition, and Y is a function from S to RL plus, that is to say uh, you specify for every agent in that coalition its uh, consumption vector in RL. And uh, it is, of course, I have not finished giving the definition. It is an objection if the following conditions are satisfied. First of all, the summation in S of Y d nu is smaller than or equal to the summation in S of E d nu. So that is the condition that you have seen before in a slightly different form. It tells you that coalition S has at its disposal this commodity vector, and it can redistribute it to its members according to the scheme Y. That is an objection, and of course, it is an objection also uh, if you have for every agent T in S, Y T at least as desired as X T, you want uh, what you give them in coalition S to be better from their viewpoint than what is given to them in the proposal. For almost every T in S, of course, almost everywhere, instead of everywhere, and a condition that you expected, you want the measure of the set of T in S such that YT is actually preferred to XT you want this to be strictly positive. You want to exclude the trivial null case in which the set of agents who actually prefer y to x is null. So here is the definition of an objection. You have, I repeat, you have a given economy uh, that describes for every agent the preference relation, the endowment vector, and uh, you consider a proposed allocation X. It's essential to keep these in mind for what is coming after, which is coming next. An allocation is a proposed distribution of the total endowment vector. It must satisfy this equality, obviously. Now, an objection to that allocation is, as we have said, S and Y, in our past terminology, we would have said that the coalition S blocks the allocation X by means of the reallocation Y. But to be very precise, you have an objection. If you have a coalition, a measurable subset of I, such that Y gives you a total demand that is at most equal to the total supply for that coalition. And in addition, every member of the coalition S must find YT at least as good as XT, and in fact, for many of them, 
that is to say a set of measure of positive measure, you have actually preference. Right? So that is old uh, old hat, simply a rephrasing of what I have told you before. Now the new concept is that of a counter objection. Now suppose that uh, X is proposed, the allocation X is proposed, and coalition S formulates an objection in the sense I have said. It has therefore to specify the way in which, in which it would redistribute its own resources, as we have said. Now a counter objection. We say that a counter objection is a pair T, Z, and as before, T is a coalition, that is to say a measurable subset of I, and Z is a function from T to RL plus. You specify what every member of coalition T is going to get. And in what sense is it a counter objection? First of all, it must be uh, possible for coalition T to achieve this result. So the first condition is that the sum over T of Z uh, D nu, I see that I have changed my notation. I should have said D lambda. Uh, I, lambda and nu are identical. Uh, so uh, whichever you prefer, uh, Z D lambda smaller than or equal to the sum in T of E D lambda. Same condition as before. That coalition can, since it disposes of this total vector, distribute it among its members in this fashion. Uh, condition B, we must have lambda of t positive. The coalition t cannot be a null coalition. It has a positive weight. All that is uh, rather irrelevant. And now, C. I have to erase uh, some of this. I will erase as little as possible. So the third condition, C, in the definition of a counter objection, you must have ZT preferred to yt almost everywhere in the set t intersect s. We'll of course explain all this. Here is the coalition and here is the coalition t. That raises a counter objection to the objection raised by coalition t. So you must have a preference for almost every t in the intersection, and you must have ZT preferred to XT almost everywhere in, I think it is T minus S, and uh, indeed it is. And by this I mean the set theoretical difference. That is to say the set of points in T that are not in S. So in what sense do we have a counter objection here? The coalition S is proposing to form. And it says to its members, all right, I give to each one of you uh, y sub t. We can do it because of um, the condition that I have here. And I give you y sub t in such a way that everyone is as pleased with y t as he or she is with x t. And in fact, many of you are more pleased. So everybody is delighted. But now, a number of players uh, says, all right, we form this coalition. We can distribute our total resources according to the scheme Z. And when we do that, 
for every player that was in S but is also in T, we can please that consumer more than with white. And that was the objection. So the understanding is that the players in this intersection are going to break rank. They were offered as members of the coalition S, they were offered YT, and now a new coalition forms and offers to each one of them a ZT that is strictly better from his or her viewpoint. And for the players that are in T but not in S, then we offer a ZT that is at least as good as the XT in the allocation. And in that sense, uh, the pair uh, T Z is a counter objection to the objection S Y. Now, of course, we will say that an objection this is a substantial simplification with respect to the definition of Aumann Maschler. So an objection S Y is justified if there is no counter objection. So now we have restricted the concept of blocking because you can block only with justified objections. So stricter definition. And the interesting uh, result of course, the bargaining set, I am going to erase a little more of this. Uh, the bargaining set, as defined by Mas Colley, is bargaining set B of the economy E uh, is the set of justified uh, of allocations for which uh, there is no justified objection. Let me write it in full. Set of allocations for which there is no justified objection. And the theorem is that the set of the bargaining set is equal to the set of Valras allocations. So the proof is uh, of the same depth as usual. It is fairly trivial to show that every allocation that is Valrasian is in the bargaining set and the hard part is of course the converse. So the moral of this story is that uh, the uh, game theorists uh, were right in objecting to the definition of uh, blocking coalitions as presented and used for several decades. But fortunately, if you make the definition stricter in restricting yourself to justified objections, then uh, you have still the equality between the set of solutions proposed and the set of Valras allocations. You can get uh, the full proof uh, in the paper that I am leaving. Is that uh, reasonably satisfactory? Yeah. But didn't we just prove in the other theorem that Right. You have a stricter definition here, because in the core, you accept blocking by all objections. Here, you accept only the justified objections. So you have, in principle, a stricter. You could have a smaller. Yes, you could have. Yes, but, but you don't. But to prove that, you need a, a serious mathematical proof.
And in the remaining hour, I want to shift to a very different set of topics. Uh, it is an area of research which uh, is wide open, which may be extremely fruitful. I am not entirely sure, but I will uh, tell you some of the results which have been achieved recently. The, what those uh, problems have in common is a use of mathematical uh, computational complexity theory, which has developed only very recently. It is, in the strict sense, a theory of algorithms. That is to say, you want to be able to say how much computation is required by a certain algorithm to solve a problem. Take, for instance, linear programming. Uh, Dan Sieg proposed an extremely efficient algorithm in 1947, but for several decades, nobody was able to explain in a satisfactory way why it was so efficient. And by efficient, I mean that the algorithm was used in thousands of applications in industry. The number of iterations required was of the order of two, three times the number of rows of the matrix A in a linear programming problem. And if you take the worst case analysis, that is to say, if you take a type of problem constructed artificially for which the number of iterations is as uh, large as it could possibly be, then this upper bound grows exponentially with the data of the problem. Well, there were several ways out of this. One of them was a, a stochastic approach. That is to say, you give yourself a probability distribution on the data of the problem, which are the matrix A and the two vectors B and C. I do not formulate exactly, for the time being, the linear programming problem. And you assume a probability distribution on A, B, C, then you can make a statement on the mean, on the expected number of iterations to solve the problem. And ideally, you want to give an upper bound on the expectation of the number of iterations. And work was done along those lines. Another approach consisted of taking seriously the worst case analysis and to try to show that there was at least a class of algorithms which was good in the sense of computational complexity. Computational complexity has recognized that if a problem can be solved with an amount of computation which is polynomial in terms of the parameters of the problem, it's a good algorithm. If it is not, that is to say, if the size of the computation to be performed grows exponentially, then it is a bad algorithm. That was one distinction. And an algorithm came out of the Soviet Union, uh, an algorithm invented by two Soviet mathematicians. And uh, Hatchian uh, proved that for that type of algorithm, which has become known as the ellipsoid algorithm, one could indeed give a polynomial upper bound on the uh, amount of computation to be performed. I am not going to present the ellipsoid algorithm because, although it was a very important achievement at the time, the algorithm itself proved out to be inefficient in actual computation. But a few years later, uh, Karl Markar came up with a new type of algorithm, an interior point algorithm. Karl Markar is at the Bell Laboratories. And uh, that algorithm turned out to be in uh, a very serious challenger for the simplex, for certain classes of problems. To me, the interesting part of the story I am telling you is the filiation of ideas. There was the simplex algorithm, which was a very practical algorithm. And a few theorists, abstract theorists, asked, why does it work? So they came up with something like the ellipsoid algorithm which did not turn out to be practical, but nevertheless, one understood better what was going on, and this stimulated, eventually, the algorithm of Karl Marker's class. Uh, in plain words, if you understand a uh, certain phenomenon better, you have a better chance of dealing with it. What I am telling you is absolutely obvious, but one has always to defend uh, abstract studies with apparently impractical goals 
uh, by the remark that eventually many of them pay off beautifully. Karl Markin's algorithm uh, has given rise to a number of variants, and I will uh, tell you about some of the most recent results. But before that, I want to talk about game theory. One great flaw of game theory and of um, economic theory is that one tends to assume that uh, the agents are infinitely intelligent, have infinite memories, are perfect in every way. They can perform extremely complex calculations at lightning speed, etc., etc. So one, it would be nice to have a theory that takes into account the limited ability of economic agents to solve problems, to memorize a number of things, and uh, I will give an example in game theory of a successful attempt of this type. But you see the connection with the theory of algorithms, because in the case of the algorithm, such as the simplex algorithm, you have an algorithm for the solution of an economic problem, namely to find an optimal production plan. And you can quantify the amount of computation to be performed to obtain a solution, as I will show later. So that is an entering wedge into the amount of computation, the amount of information processing, the quantity of memory that is necessary for an agent to solve a problem. In the case of the simplex algorithm, it is translated in terms of computer time. Uh, you have to gather the data and to process the data. And uh, when the problem becomes too large, as is well known, it is intractable. At any state of the technology, there is a bound on what can be achieved. Well, let me go uh, to game theory. I will consider the uh, prisoner's dilemma, which has been another intellectual challenge to game theorists for several decades. And I give the matrix here in the following form. So we have two players, and each one of them has two strategies. They are the two prisoners in the fable. Uh, so the first prisoner can either defect or cooperate, and the second prisoner can defect or cooperate. I am not going to tell you the story. You probably all know it anyway. And this is the, the payoff to the first player is the first number appearing here, and the payoff to the second player is the other. So let us uh, analyze it uh, very quickly in uh, the usual terms. If the second player knows that the first player is going to defect, then the payoff to the second player is 1 in this case, 0 in this case. So you would choose D2. If the other player chooses to cooperate, the second player has payoff 4 in this case, 3 in that case. And therefore, no matter what the first player does, he has every reason to choose D2. The reasoning is symmetric, and the first player also has every reason to defect. So altogether, they will both defect. They will get 1-1. One, one. If they had cooperated, they would have got 3-3. Three, three. So this uh, dilemma, which I have presented in the starkest possible terms, is uh, already quite old in game theory. One has tried to resolve it in different ways. There has been work by Roy Radner, by Steve Smell, separately, along different lines. And what I want to tell you today about is a result of Abraham Neyman. And the interest of it is that precisely it takes into account all the limitations I have told you about. And he obtains the result according to which if you take two players playing the repeated uh, prisoner's dilemma, that is to say they are facing each other, possibly not seeing each other. You know how experiments in game theory are concocted. You have two players at uh, different consoles in different rooms, and they have full information, and one observes what they do. In this case, we repeat the prisoner's dilemma, let us say uh, capital N times, and uh, we observe what they do. There was, incidentally, a remarkably interesting book written by Axel Rod, in which he consulted a large number of game theorists and asked each one of them 
what strategy would you play if you had to play the prisoner's dilemma? Then in a computer simulation, he matched those strategies with each other. And uh, the strategy that came out best is also the simplest. It is tit for tat. And that is very simple. You are player one or player two. Uh, the first play of the game, you cooperate. And from then on, you do exactly what the other player has done on the previous iteration. If he has defected on the previous iteration, you defect. If he has cooperated, you cooperate. And that strategy won uh, in Axelrod simulation against any sophisticated strategy proposed by uh, all the experts on game theory. Uh, remarkably, uh, Axelrod made that result known to all the participants and asked them to uh, submit a new strategy, which they did, and uh, lo and behold, the same thing occurred. Did for start was the winner, even on the second time. And not many had proposed it for that as a strategy on the second iteration of this game. In any case, we, we are going to uh, iterate uh, the game. And in order to model the limitations I told you about, we uh, represent each one of the players by a finite automaton. This can be phrased very generally. We have a set of players, a finite set, i from 1 to m. And what is a finite uh, automaton? I give the formal definition. Uh, and I will, of course, interpret all these objects. You have mi, let me write it first, qi, fi, and gi. So it's a quadruple of mathematical objects. And the interpretation is as follows. So this, we have for each player a quadruple, like that. Mi is the set of states of the automaton, a finite set. And that will, in fact, the size of the set Mi will give us the complexity that the first player can entertain. If he is, uh, uh, if he has a very slow, limited intelligence, memory, etc. Uh, the automaton has to be of small size. You can entertain only so many states, different states. For a clever person, presumably, MI would be large. In any case, it's a finite set, the set of possible states of the automaton. QI is an element of MI. It is a state. It is the initial state. You have to give yourself the initial state in order to describe what is going to happen. Fi is a function from Mi to, I should have said earlier, A sub i is the finite set of possible actions for the ice player. So in a game, it would be the finite set of pure strategies, for instance. And Fi is a function from Mi to Ai. And it simply tells the ice player, if you are in a certain state, an element of Mi, then this is what you do. And the player, of course, can choose this automaton as he likes. And finally, gi is a function from mi to uh, product a minus i to mi. It is simply the transition function, because you are going to iterate. So it tells you if, at a certain stage, you have a certain state of the automaton, and the other agents, minus i, have chosen those particular actions, this is the state in which you will be at the next iteration. So there you have your automaton. And uh, the critical factor is the number of, element of, of elements of capital Mi. That determines the, uh, everything that we have said. But otherwise, as you have uh, the initial state specified, then, of course, each player, given the initial state, knows what action to take. Given the actions of all the others and the state in your own state, you decide what state will be uh, the new state of the automaton. And you iterate.
for this is uh, very abstract. Let me, for instance, in the example of tit for tat, spell out what the automaton would be. The automaton would be simply the set of states one and two. And uh, you have the initial state, which is one, cooperate. And then you have the two functions f and g, which I will write out in full. So f of one is cooperate, f of two is defect. We have said that uh, given a state of your automaton, it must determine the action that you take. So that, there it is. And the only thing I have not specified is the transition function. And I am now doing it. So we have g of 1 and c is equal to uh, g of 2 and c. And it is equal to 1. And g of 1 and d is equal to g of do 2 and d. And it is equal to 2. And it is exactly what I have said. If you iterate, you will see that the game is played exactly as tit for tat is being played. So if you are in state one, you cooperate. Of course, the f and g are the same for the two players. And uh, if you are in state two, you defect. And as for the transition function, if the other player has cooperated, no matter what your state, you cooperate. If he has defected, no matter what state you are in, you defect. So there you are. Now, you have, of course, a payoff. So you can think in those very general terms for a game with M players, or you can think of the uh, prisoner's dilemma. And this is one example of an automaton that you can choose. Of course, uh, as the player, you are going to choose the automaton that will represent you. But the number of states may be an upper bound on the choices that you can make. And finally, I have to specify the payoff. Uh, let us call the payoff for the actions uh, A i1 and A i2 for the two players. This would be at iteration i. So we have the two players. Those are the actions they have chosen. And of course, the payoff is 1 over n, the uh, sum over all the repetitions of the g of a i1 and a i2. That is to say, you iterate the prisoner's dilemma or whatever game you are playing, and you take as a payoff the average of the payoff that you receive. not have erased the matrix, but uh, you will remember the critical numbers, 1, 1, 3, 3. And as an example, uh, so we will call for the first player, L1 will be the size of M1, and L2 will be the size of uh, M2. L1 is the complexity of the first player, and L2 the complexity of the second. An instance, a numerical instance, to give you some idea of the numbers that are involved. Suppose that you perform a 1,000 uh, times repetition of the prisoner's dilemma. And suppose that the complexity of the two players be very large. But I will give a very precise and general result following Neyman. Suppose that it is 1 million in each case. Then there is, according to Neyman, an equilibrium strategy for the repeated game in which the payoffs of the two players are greater than or equal to 2.9. And remember that if they cooperate, uh, the payoff is 3.3. And that is one sense in which, expecting a more general result, which I will state here on the blackboard, the sense in which you can with uh, limited 
intelligence, memory, etc., on a repeated prisoner's dilemma, come close to cooperation. And the exact result of Neyman is uh, the following. You, I did not leave a Xerox copy of Neyman's paper because it is published. It appeared in the economics letters. So given any k, which is intended to be a large number, there is an n0, that is to say a number of repetitions, such that if n is at least equal to n0, and, and that is where the complexity comes in, the minimum of L1, L2, and the maximum of L1, L2, so we take the smallest of the two and the largest of the two, and if this is between n, the power 1 over k, and n to the k, then the, there is a, an equilibrium strategy, pair of strategies for the repeated game, in which the payoffs to each players are greater than or equal to, when I am referring to the matrix I have erased, 3 minus 1 over k. So let us uh, see what it means. You give yourself an arbitrarily large number k, then there is a number of repetitions such that if n is at least equal to n0, and if the complexity of the two players are bounded below and above, so one of them, L1, can be extremely small, n to 1 over k. Imagine that k is 1 million, then this is n to the power 10 to the minus 6, and this would be n to the power 10 to the 6. So L2 can be enormously larger than L1. One player can be much, much smarter than the other. But nevertheless, if this is satisfied, then they would be very close to cooperating. Well, that is only one result among uh, many, but it gives you the flavor of what I had in mind. It is, uh, there are, uh, it's a very recent development, but the attempt to use uh, computational complexity theory, the theory of finite automata, to model the, uh, the limited abilities of human beings uh, is embodied in this fairly nice result. Re keep in mind that the prisoner's dilemma was a great intellectual challenge for which there was really no satisfactory solution until a couple of years ago. And this is one possible way of uh, getting out of the dilemma. And finally, I want to say a few words, but this will be of interest only for those of you who have looked closely at linear programming. I want to say a few words about an even more active, much more active area of research. I will formulate um, the linear programming problem in the following manner. You have a matrix A that is M by N, M rows and columns. And I write the constraints in the form AX equal to B, that is to say the slack variables have been thrown in. And uh, you want uh, X to be greater than or equal to zero and you want to minimize Ctx. Whether you choose minimization, maximization makes no difference, but um, I want to present the result exactly as it is presented in the unpublished paper by Montero and Adler, a paper that, uh, once again, is available. Uh, from uh, Mr. T. 
false. Or Mr. Goodfield. We do not know. It's an unpublished paper that was released uh, just on the eve of the day when I left Berkeley. It's, I cannot do more current than this. It cannot be more current. And uh, one now tries to give an exact estimate of the amount of computation required to solve this problem using an algorithm of the new type, the so-called interior uh, point algorithms. As you know, in the simplex algorithm, you have that convex polytope. You go from one vertex to another vertex. You always stay on the boundary. In the new class of algorithms, on the contrary, you stay in the interior of the polytope. And that is uh, uh, the, that was the contribution of Karl Markar to start uh, the development about which I am reporting. The quantity that I introduce to express the result is capital L. Capital L uh, is exactly the number of bits required to encode the data of the problem. So for each AIJ and train the matrix, you take the absolute value of AIJ and you take the logarithm is base 2. Every a number appearing in A, B, C is assumed to be an integer, which can always be done, yes. If your numbers are given with uh, six decimals, you multiply in one equation by 10 to the 6. That is the only way in which you can discuss uh, precision in computation effectively. So to encode the data, you need uh, the sum of all the bits required for all the numbers appearing there. That is L. It is the size of the problem. The algorithm given by Montero and Adler, and I think that is the best result of its type. It is interesting how in a very few years now, whenever you propose an algorithm, you have to give a complexity analysis that tells you uh, how much computation will be involved in solving the problem. It was unthinkable before. Certainly, fortunately, uh, this consideration did not stop Danzig in 1947, since complexity theory was yet to be born, as we understand it. So an algorithm was proposed. If it worked well, uh, practically, then uh, being a pure pragmatist, the operations researchers, the mathematical programmers would use it until something better came around. But now one feels obligated to give a complexity analysis and to judge an algorithm by the results of that analysis. So the algorithm of Montero and Adler that will be left undescribed, but you have a full description in the paper that I leave here. Uh, first of all, it solves the problem in a number of iterations. Number of iterations. Which is of the order capital O of square root of n, n being, as I have said, times L. That is the number of iterations required. And as for the number of arithmetic operations to be performed at each step in the iteration, and uh, here, of course, uh, the uh, writers, uh, the authors of the paper I have mentioned, cleverly use the particular structure of the matrix, which has to be inverted, and show that you can, in fact, solve the uh, inversion of that particular matrix at each step in the iteration in the number of arithmetic operations, that is O of n to the 2.5. So altogether, the amount of computation, the number of arithmetic operations to be performed is O to the n to the L. And that is, uh, as far as I know, the best result currently available for the solution of linear programming problems. So there is an algorithm there that, of course, has not been uh, fully tested on practical problems, and that is the ultimate proof, of course. Uh, but nevertheless, in terms of complexity analysis, 
This is the best bound, upper bound, that you can give. It means that uh, the amount of computation is at most equal to some constant multiplied by n3 times l. So when the matrix becomes very large, uh, uh, those two numbers uh, grow. But you see, this is certainly polynomial, in fact, of a low degree in uh, one of the parameters of the uh, problem. It is assumed in all this that uh, m is uh, of the order capital O of n, which is a very reasonable assumption. So there is no doubt that complexity theory has already contributed a great deal to uh, linear programming. It has even led to the development of practical algorithms that are challenging the simplex. And uh, there is uh, a beginning of, uh, in the applications of complexity theory to game theory, results of the type provided by Neyman. And I am very hopeful that one can go much farther. And it's exactly 5 o'clock. So I will be glad to entertain questions. Uh, and the best I can do is to uh, uh, make you curious about the contents of the various papers I have mentioned. Uh, no, their approaches are quite different. Smell has studied the uh, prisoner's dilemma, but has made no use of uh, complexity and finite automata. Six Smell's paper was published in uh, Econometrica, and I have, there is probably a reference to it in Neyman's paper. Yes, Smell, 1980, Econometrica, the prisoner's dilemma and dynamical systems. You guessed it. Smell is a great expert on dynamical systems associated to non-comparative games. But it's a very different approach. And similarly, uh, Radner's approach is very different. No, I don't think, no, not for in the prisoner's dilemma, no. It has not proved to be a fruitful approach to the problem. There are other results um, in the same vein as Neyman's result, and you will find here a reference to Rubinstein, for instance. And, uh, and some work of uh, Bob Auman is also relevant. But you will hear more about it. Uh, this was only a brief communication in economics letters, and there will be a more substantial paper coming later. I have to qualify my answer since it is work in progress. Yes. So I believe that one can go further, but one has to wait for the papers uh, that I have uh, alluded to for more specific results. And I am not sure that uh, finite automaton is the best way to formulate the problem, to model the problem we are discussing, although it seems very appropriate in the case of the prisoner's dilemma. And you saw how simple the metrics, the automata were for the tit for tat solution. I understand that Megiddo at the IBM Research Laboratory in San Jose is going to run a more sophisticated um, experiment along the lines of Axelrod. So we will see uh, what comes out of it. The strategies proposed by uh, our colleagues in game theory were sometimes incredibly sophisticated but they did not work. <laughs> How do you think the complexity analysis bear upon the standard economic uh, theory? Oh, 
I am talking about the distant future now, but it is clear that we would love to have an economic theory that take in, takes into account the limitations on the agents. Information gathering, information processing, memory, etc., etc. And those are precisely the ways in which you can do it. You can uh, give a quantitative measure of the uh, amount of information to be processed. You can encode the number of bits uh, in any numerical information in the form of L. Still, if you want to um, satisfy the assumptions of the model, you need an enormous amount of information gathering. So you know the prices of all the commodities, and, uh, yes, and you must uh, explore all the possibilities uh, before you purchase. So it would be nice. And as you know, in linear programming itself, uh, there were several schemes that tried to quantify the uh, saving on computation due to decentralization. If you take the revised simplex form in Danzig's book, uh, the decomposition algorithm was another attempt. So those were situations in which it was possible to quantify this vague concept in economics that certain ways of solving a problem are much more economical in terms of information than others. But that remains very vague. Here there is a possibility of uh, giving an exact answer. We shall see. Uh, it's all very recent. Complexity theory has come into its own in the last few years, and uh, it's a booming field. And those are two potential applications. Thank you. 